welcome. I am your host Atri Mohanta and you're watching the ACJ Newscast. Asian College of Journalism in collaboration with UNICEF hosted a seminar on media and child rights. The first session focused on the media reporting children through a gendered lens with emphasis on ethics and guidelines journalists should follow. Ashwak Masoodi, an independent journalist and long form writer, spoke about the importance of giving context to juvenile crimes. But um, what I have realized is that if we have so much time and space to write about the gory details of how metal rods were inserted into the vagina and pulled out and the intestines were just rolling around in the bus, then the context, writing the context about what is happening around the life of a criminal is also equally important and should get that space. Um, I, I, I think that that should not be confused with actually giving public sympathy to the criminal. There is absolutely uh, no way a crime can be justified. But you, what you're doing by giving these details out is actually giving a holistic picture of the story, which is your job as a journalist, giving a whole, the whole picture. As Ashwak Masoodi started the conversation on child rights, Kavita Murlidharan, an independent journalist, shed more light on issues that girl children face. She explained how the taboo on menstruation forces young girls to endure extremely unhygienic conditions. I think the media needs to speak a lot more on menstruation and the issues concerning it in uh, general. So I visited this village called uh, Kovalaburam near Madurai last year, last January exactly, where uh, the village has a separate house for menstruating women. It's outside of the village. It's on the border of the village. So women who are menstruating have to leave their houses and uh, and. I mean, and stay for three to five days till they bleed in that particular house. I did the story for Pari. Uh, what was uh, very shocking for me was that there was no toilet in that uh, house, no toilet anywhere nearby. So they had to go walk a little bit uh, to kind of defecate. So it was a very uh, shocking story. And the menstruate, the most of the menstruating women who had stayed there, luckily for them, the village is populated, and uh, you know they need not stay alone. But the women I met there were younger than 18, like they were, they were children and they were kind of getting used to the fact that they had to stay alone in a house because it's been happening for several years. Nobody knows how long, but everyone says it's been happening forever. And then after I, uh, I, I got to know this from a friend of mine who had worked on a documentary uh, film on this issue. And after the story came out, there are many people who call up and say similar things are happening across Tamil Nadu, like in Pudukotai, and uh, and in several villages in and around Madurai, this happens. So, it I think uh, the media needs to speak about menstruation and young women, how the issues are uh, being seen and being treated. Putting children in watertight gendered compartments can take a toll on a child's mental health. Pooja Nair, a psychotherapist, explains how gender should not just be binary. To say that raising a child or uh, uh, child rearing is a gendered project or a project of engendering. There, there are ideas that we carry about there being only two types of bodies, that's male and female. Therefore, we see non-consensual, quote-unquote, corrective surgeries on intersex babies because the doctors and the families and the medical institution and science cannot figure out what this body means. And we, we, we are saying that they cannot figure out whether to put this body in a female box or in the male box. And then therefore, let's try to figure out what we can do surgically in order to fit the body. So that's the, the idea of two bodies. So that's the body binary that we function on in terms of perspective. We function on the idea of the gender binary. So these two bodies are rigidly tied to only two gender types. Presence of penis equals uh, man. Absence of penis equals woman. And therefore, these are the only two ways in which genders can be experienced and lived. And there is absolutely no space for anybody who falls outside of this idea. Now, what I'm trying to say is that the idea 
and this social construct is oppressive, not the way people are living. So it's uh, to, to try and sort of uh, look at how distress is socially produced. There is no inherent distress when we talk of gender and sexuality. And then, of course, these two bodies and two genders rigidly tied to only one form of sexuality. And it's important to talk about gender and sexuality in this open, expansive sort of way because it's an idea that oppresses everybody. It just hits you that engendering is such a huge part of this whole engagement with children. The right kind of gendering, the right, the correct form of gendering and how those ideas then become oppressive. Uh, simple things like teaching girls how to sit is a project of engendering. Oh, so these are ways in which engendering happens and it's an integral part of child rearing. And therefore, when we talk child rights, we will have to talk gender. As the first session came to an end, the second session shed light on communicating with children during emergencies like the ongoing pandemic. While mental health is an important part of a child's overall development, their physical safety is equally important. Sonal Kapoor, founder director of the Protsahan India Foundation, who works with abuse victims, brings to light the legal ways children can be protected from abuse. That it's easier for us to look at a child marriage thing and you know newspaper report and say oh you know the number of balviva cases or the child marriage cases have gone up but if we look at incest then the the matter comes within the police and everything and we've we've seen you know people who've been working in the sector uh, with cw's child welfare commit committees or J J juvenile justice boards etc we have seen many and enough times all with the police systems um it's it's always it's it's easier to get the poxo um you know that kind of the legal proceedings just even following up leave alone what the consequence or the judgment ends up coming um and talking about poxo i think uh, there, there's quite a bit that the high courts also need to learn um because one wrong judgment one judgment which which is passed without looking at the precedents without looking at the practical consequences on the ground um i i think it, it leaves so much for us to you know because we are gagging our children constantly and it's not just the pandemic like you rightly said Ramya it's it's so much before and after because just last week the Bombay High Court came up with the uh, judgment that if it's not skin to skin um, contact and abuse then it's not abuse under POXO and I think so anybody wearing gloves can do it and it will not be considered uh, you know sexual uh, abuse so I think um, it's, it's, it's a lot for us to do as adults, I think, uh, before we even, you know, uh, put the blame or put the onus of safety onto our children. Because even when we teach um, children, you know, um, the safe touch and the unsafe touch, still 80% of the people call it good touch and bad touch. You know, um, why can't that touch for a 19 year old feel, you know, pleasurable if, if it's with consent? Um, so a lot of con questions about consent, a lot of questions about safe and unsafe and not good and bad. A lot of questions about what our children want. I think as 19, 20, 21 year olds, uh, we still think they are children. We still um, in, in the Indian setup of things, we feel, we still feel if, if a 30 year old is living with the parents, if you know she or he is a child so there's a lot for us as adults to question here on nandini raman a consulting counselor went on to explain the importance of sex education and its sensitization in the indian context it's the same thing when it comes to sex ed you know you are not comfortable talking about sex so i rather not talk about it you know, and then we just brush it under the carpet. But I rather I talk about it, I sensitize the child, then he actually go and explore or ask his best buddy who is also 13 and 14, you know, and then they end up in, in a bigger mess, not knowing what it is that they want to actually try out and explore. So I think, yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's, been, it's been a lot, but I think it's, it's been so beautiful at so many levels because it's taught us so much so much and I don't think uh, you know any other time or a circumstance would have uh, taught us so much. An educator herself, S. Gomati, director of AHA Guru, explained what problems children from rural areas are facing due to the pandemic. She explained that the children are very bright and eager to learn, but access to online education is a huge problem to them. 
actually with uh, help of aid india we also uh, in the pandemic uh, uh, period we reached around 80000 children in the rural part of tamil nadu so we gave them a free course uh, so basically uh, we aha guru as an app through app we gave the modules when you look at uh, a village right so what happens is there children generally i mean we can talk about pandemic wearing mask etc but what we really saw is like they are very close they are very close and they play so there the problem is not about playing or socializing but the problem on the other hand was access to education so they don't they don't have complete close, like one year is lost i mean uh, look at the a child in an urban setup even with all these confusions parents um, put lot more pressure but on the on the rural setup is completely different so when we gave this fractions course the completion rates were like super high in fact we are like uh, currently we started with 1000 2000 now the number grew to 80000 children so we are almost going to touch a lakh so that is basically basically the needs also differ when you go to different segments one of the pro so synchronous asynchronous what we did was like uh, we did a proper structured uh, course which helped the child go step by step like just like a climbing the ladder so understanding this and developing the modules definitely i think uh, uh, technology opens up access to good high quality education irrespective of your geography because earlier if a teacher is very good in uh, uh, chennai a child in dharmapuri cannot even reach uh, that kind of cannot get that kind of an access today that access has been like uh, uh, made uh, viable so i think that technology has done but you cannot replica what is there in the uh, in person thing uh, directly to an online the seminar not only highlighted the various aspects of child rights and how the media can report these issues sensitively but also how these children can be helped in various ways thank you for watching the acj newscast do let us know your thoughts on our facebook page asian college of journalism and our twitter handle at the rate acj india this is your host atri signing off thank you for watching